particular example. And uh, let me remind you, this example was two-dimensional and equal 2, 2 uh, supersymmetry. So we discussed various properties of the supersymmetry algebra and the graviton multiplet and so on. And so we got to the um, generalized kinnick spinner equation. So the variation of the gravitino takes this form and this uh, uh, two-dimensional uh, reduction of uh, new minimal supergravity. <laughs> And these dots, 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 as I said yesterday, these are terms which uh, involve the gravitino, so if you wish they are nonlinear. Uh, and so, so they are zero when we set to zero um, the gravitino itself. And uh, we have these two uh, complex parameters. They have opposite R charge. So V mu is the gauge field that couples to the R charge. And then this H and H tilde. So that represents a complex uh, scalar. Um, that we have in our uh, graviton multiple, it is an auxiliary field. And so, uh, so now we could uh, take this, uh, this equation and study the, what are the most general solutions. So we'll not do that. Um, this has been done by uh, Cremonese and Closet. But I will just present two uh, simple classes of solutions, which are almost exhaustive. And uh, um, OK, let me also make uh, one observation that since we are in two dimensions, rotations are uh, a group of rotations SO2, which is U1. So the, the spin connection is, is a standard abelian gauge field. So it's convenient to introduce this omega mu without further indices, uh, which is just the contraction of the a spin connection with anti-symmetric indices, the, the uh, joint of uh, SO2 uh, with an epsilon tensor. And so in this sense, you see that uh, uh, spin in two dimensions is not different from any other abelian gauge, uh, gauge charge. Uh, in fact, the, 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 the covariant derivative of a, of a field of spin S, if you take a certain component of spin S, uh, is just uh, uh, so S plays the role of an abelian charge. And this is the standard covari abelian covariant derivative. So what solutions we can find of this? So one class of solutions uh, is uh, essentially what we do. So we set to 0 this, this scalar, so we don't use it. Uh, and then, so in here we have the spin. And here we have this uh, abelian charge. And as you say, the spin is another abelian charge. So we can just arrange. Uh, for this gauge field to exactly cancel the spin connection such that this becomes a, a standard derivative. And so we can just choose a constant for this uh, spinner. So what do we choose? So we choose V mu to be equal to a half omega mu, a half because epsilon is spin one half. Uh, and then epsilon, we just choose uh, a constant. Uh, but of course, in this derivative, so spin has two components, plus one half and minus one half spin. So this can only work for one of the two components, not both. Um, so one of them. So uh, again, I'm using a base in which I diagonalize the chirality. Um, and uh, here is the opposite story, because the R charge is opposite. And then this H is, is 0. So this is a simple class of solution. This, in fact, works on any orientable manifold, on any Riemann surface of any genus. And in fact, this is uh, called a, a topological A-twist. So, so, so this is a solution that's been known for a long time. Uh, and once again, allows us to put any uh, to the dimensional theory with this amount of supersymmetry on, on any uh, orientable Riemann surface. Uh, and and uh, correctly, I mean, this, this uh, solution that was not found in the past was in this uh, machine in the Office of Tuchin Cyber, but of course has to fit in, in this framework, and uh, it does. Yes? So, there is a gamma phi in the spin connection that you say that you cannot satisfy both for both? 
Yeah, so, so, so if I write in this way, uh, using the, I mean, say that the spin connection is just a, a U1 gauge field, then a spin has two components, plus one half, minus a half. So in this formula, I really have to put the Z component of, this, of the spin. So if you want in these two components, for one I have to put plus one half, and for the other one minus one half. But on the other hand, the two components are, are, have the same R charge. So only, I can only cancel one component. And the other one is still a section of a bundle, and on a Riemann surface there are no, uh, there are no non-vanishing sections of these bundles, uh, because of course one of the conditions that this is uh, nowhere vanishing. Uh, otherwise, at that point, we don't have uh, the specific transformations. Okay, so, so once again, this, this was constant. Okay, and in this topological a twist, one finds a very simple algebra. So now we should take this solution, plug it back into the, the supergravity variations, and if you wish, in the supergravity action. And for instance, the algebra is very simple. There are these two variations, variation with respect to epsilon and variation with respect to epsilon tilde. They square to zero, and the anti-commutator is zero. Um, so it's a, it's a very simple algebra. Um, yes. And in fact, for a genus bigger than one, this is essentially the only solution. Um, OK, this is not new. However, there is another solution, which is also interesting. And in this solution, instead, we turn on this H, but we don't, we don't turn on this V. So if you want, this is an uh, untwisted solution. And so, uh, so this is the solution. So we set V mu to 0. We turn on this H. where R is the, uh, well, in fact, OK. In fact, this solution works on, uh, on uh, uh, S2, on the round S2. <coughs> OK, so R is the radius of the sphere. And then if we plug in and we see what we get, we get these equations. Uh, one for epsilon, and a similar one for epsilon tilde. And in fact, what these equations are, these are killing spinner equations. Uh, on the round sphere. And it turns out that, uh, uh, in fact, there are four. So each of these solutions, each of these equations has two solutions. So in total, there are four solutions. Uh, so I'm not going to write the solution, but it's not. I mean, you can you can go ahead and, and solve it. Uh, I mean, on the on the round sphere, it's, it's not difficult. So there are four solutions. Uh, and so in particular, uh, in, uh, OK, something that I didn't, didn't say here. Um, um, yeah, so in this case, there are two solutions. So one solution is epsilon minus, and one solution is uh, this epsilon tilde plus. So in the topological a twist, uh, we break half of the super so we can preserve only half of the super of the supercharges of the supersymmetries but in the case we find four solutions and so in fact uh, we, we, so, so we started with four and we can preserve all, all of them on the on the on the on the s2 okay so this solution preserves more supersymmetries and, uh, um, and so this is interesting. If you want, this is new with respect to, I don't know, 30 years ago. This was not uh, noticed before. And then once again, we can go back and plug into uh, um, supergravity. And then we find, in this case, the supersymmetry algebra is deformed. Well, I mean, as I say, there is also this trial and error method that you can use. Uh, but um, yeah, 
I mean, it was not, uh, this was not discussed at the time. The, the, you know, this topological twist uh, was, was uh, discovered and discussed uh, 30 or something years ago. But at the time, only this was, uh, was observed. Uh, and these um, this type of solutions are more new. If you want, it's a two-dimensional version of what Pestum constructed on the S4. OK, so what about the supersymmetry algebra? Uh, so this time, the supersymmetry algebra is deformed. So the anti-commutator of uh, some epsilon and epsilon tilde is equal to the following. So there is a lead derivative along a killing vector. Uh, this killing vector, OK, I didn't write it in my note, but essentially is a, is a sandwich of this epsilon and epsilon tilde. This came you up to some factors that I, I don't have here. It's essentially some epsilon tilde dag uh, gamma mu epsilon, or, or maybe there is a transpose here. I'm not sure. But it's a bilinear in these two, in these two spinors. Uh, so, so, so a lead derivative is the generator of translations. So this means that this, is, uh, this symmetry here is a rotation on the, on the, on the, of the S2. So it is a symmetry, in fact. And then there is another piece uh, which instead involves the, uh, the R symmetry, which is this vector-like R symmetry that we are assuming here. So it's, it's the one that couples to, to, to V. Uh, while the other anti-commutator vanish. And so you see, this is uh, a deformation of the flat space uh, uh, supersymmetry algebra, because in the flat space supersymmetry algebra, we do have, uh, of course, the anti-commutator of supercharge is momentum. And this lead derivative is uh, well, this generated translation. So this is momentum. Uh, but, but, but this is a deformation, right? Because now the R charge enters into the algebra. And correctly, in fact, this is suppressed by a power of R. So we take R very large, and we go back to flat space. This deformation goes away, um, as, it, as it should. Now, in fact, what this, uh, what this algebra is, uh, well, this is, uh, uh, as you say, this is genera ge uh, generates rotations of the sphere. So this is uh, SO3. Uh, and in fact, the full algebra is SU2 slash 1. Let me call it A, uh, because uh, it uses the vector like uh, uh, R charge in the same way as the A twist does. Uh, and uh, so this is a superalgebra. In fact, the bosonic part of the superalgebra is uh, SU2 uh, times U1. Uh, so SU2 is rotations of the sphere, and U1 is this vector-like uh, uh, R symmetry. OK, uh, let me also notice something that we mentioned yesterday about this, uh, this part of the solution. You see, here, as I say, I'm using this notation in which tilded uh, fields are fields that will be complex conjugate uh, in Lorentzian signature, but then in Euclid and become independent. And you see, they are not complex conjugate because uh, there is no, well, H tilde is not minus i over r, it's still a plus. So they're not complex conjugate. So this is not the weak rotation of a, a real background in uh, Lorentzian signature. And so as you say, that this uh, breaks reflection positivity. OK. Any question? Can you trace some H2 degrees minus I at all? I'm sorry? Can you use the chosen H2 degrees minus I at all? Well, then it doesn't solve the equations. It's just the case of one S2. I'm sorry? You can put minus I. So I can try to do H equal I over R. Yeah, yeah. HD equals minus I over R. It just doesn't solve the equations. OK, so, so, uh, okay. so now that we have, uh, as I say, this uh, is not an uh, exhaustive list, but almost. Uh, there is something else that we can do on T2, and this leads to the elliptic genus. And on the round S2, um, well, of course, on the round S2, notice that we have now two solutions. That we have the twist, and we have the untwist. So on the very same manifold, still we have two ways of preserving supersymmetry. This is what at the beginning of my lecture I called the background. So even just specifying the manifold does not fix this in, a, in an uh, unambiguous way 
the way to preserve supersymmetry. Here we have two ways, and they lead to different observables if you compute partition functions. Uh, the, the twisted theory, there is a way of uh, making it uh, equivariant with respect to rotations, but I will not discuss that. I'm sorry, I cannot hear could you, you. Could you deform the S2 as well, but it still preserve some kind of supersymmetry? Yes, for instance, something that, we can do, that you can do is to squash this S2. So if you do, then you are, you are back to two supercharges. Now it turns out that the partition function does not depend on this quashing. So there is really no point in doing that. Uh, but uh, at the level of supersymmetry, it will be half. No, sorry, so I was not. Uh, so you, you take this background and you ask, okay, this background, how many, I mean, it gives me some uh, super algebra, how many supercharges does it have? Uh, this supercharge has four supercharges. So the very same that you started with in the UV. So this background is not breaking any supercharge, it's just deforming the algebra. And it's different from the twist, because the twist breaks half of the supersymmetries. Oh, okay, yes. So, well, you can either just say, okay, I compute the partition function, and then you, pres you preserve all the supercharges. Or you can say, uh, I want to insert observables, and observables are going to break uh, some of the supercharges. Uh, for instance, you can uh, insert Wilson lines, Wilson loops, and uh, they break half of the supercharges. Uh, you can also insert local operators at two antipodal points. Uh, and they are compatible with Wilson loops if the Wilson loops is a special, uh, well, it's on the equator or something like that. Uh, and so, so uh, they, all this configuration preserves two supercharges. Whereas in the Piston version, you will not be able to do it. In Piston's version, uh, yeah. uh, I think that, I mean, since the, he doesn't have an option, well. No, but yeah, the other yeah. version, version. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, I'm not sure if without the, the observables you will have more. Maybe you, you, you do have more supercharges. Yes. Regarding the supergiga, does this uh, does it matter whether the, the parameter is supergiga or complex? To, to, to see whether it's actually two, the killing vectors. Uh, because coming with four spinners, I would have expected four spinners. All the combinations, of all the possible combinations of linears. Uh, well, I mean, if you construct these uh, bilinears, uh, this tilde epsilon, uh, uh, you construct t out of this, you get three. Uh, no, I mean you can try. You will get three. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, because this gives you the the, the rotations of the sphere, uh, which are SO3, uh, so you don't get more. Uh, these uh, these parameters here, no, they are uh, they are complex. So you're gonna that that is real and it's a proper Yes. Yes. Maybe there is a dagger here. Uh, I, 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 okay, I didn't write this expression in my notes, uh, but yes, you can try. You plug in your killing spinners and you get uh, solution for those, and you get the killing the killing vectors of the of the sphere. I, I, I can look uh, afterwards. OK. Um, so now I would like to, uh, let's see. OK, we'll, we'll be a bit uh, quick. But uh, so I, now I would like to uh, do this to, to see how to, to perform the actual localization. And so I would like to focus on a class of theories. Uh, so again, we are in 2D n equal 2 comma 2. So let's focus uh, on uh, gauge theories. And in particular, let's uh, consider simple theories in which we only use vector multiplet and the chiral multiplets. 
Uh, there are more general theories. Uh, there are more multiplets in this, uh, with this supersymmetry. So there are more general theories that you can consider. But let's just uh, consider this simple example, which is interesting enough. And these multiplets are just a dimensional reduction from four dimensions. So I'm not going to spell out what these multiplets are, because you can work it out yourself. Uh, let me just list uh, the data that enters in these theories. So of course, there is a gauge group. Uh, then uh, the matter is in chiral multiplets. So these chiral multiplets are in some representations of the gauge group. Of course, this representation in general can be reducible. Um, then an important observation is that uh, the, the, the supersymmetry algebra, as you said, is deformed. Is this SU2 slash 1. And so in particular, so here we have uh, the, 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 the symmetry group of the sphere, but we also have the R symmetry. So this is different from flat space. Now, the, so it's, if you want, wish, it's in some sense more similar to super, uh, super conformal symmetry. The R symmetry is part of the algebra. And because of that, uh, the, the theory does depend on the R charges that we choose. It's not true in flat space. In flat space, the R charges are some assignments, but they do not affect the theory. They do not affect the Lagrangian. But on the curved uh, space, uh, they do affect the Lagrangian. So we'll have to choose some R charges. They control some curvature couplings. And the reason is that this uh, R symmetry does enter into the algebra. So, so, so we have to choose R charges for these, uh, for these chiral multiplets. Uh, then there are interactions. And we have uh, uh, superpotential interactions. Uh, that you, so this is just dimensional reduction from four dimensions. So it's the same story, some holomorphic function of chiral multiplets. Uh, there is also a new object in two dimensions, which is a twisted superpotential. And this twisted, twisted superpotential is an holomorphic function of twisted chiral multiplets that are another multiplet that exists in this dimension. And uh, uh, so we are not putting other matter in twisted chiral multiplets, but it turns out that out of the vector multiplet, you can construct a twisted chiral multiplet. Unfortunately, I don't have time to, to spell this out in details. But essentially, you can rearrange the same fields in the vector of the vector multiplet into a twisted chiral. Multiplet. If you wish, this is similar to what you do in four dimensions. You start with a vector multiplet, and you can rearrange them in the W alpha, which is a, a chiral multiplet, the field strength, uh, the multiplet of the field strength. So this is similar, but it's a, it's a twisted chiral multiplet. And out of this, you can specify an holomorphic function. This is called the twisted superpotential, and this is something that you can add to the, to the Lagrangian. Uh, and then there is another object, uh, which, again, I will not go into details. These are called twisted masses. And these are related to, global to flavor symmetries. And so here the idea is that every time that you have a global symmetry, you can couple. Uh, well, first of all, you have a current. Of course, if this global symmetry is continuous, then you can couple to background gauge field. This is something that we always do. However, now we are in a supersymmetric theory, and so we should actually couple to a full vector multiplet, a background vector multiplet. And since in two dimensions the vector multiplet contains a scalar, now there is a scalar uh, in this background multiplet to which we can give an expectation value. And if you work out in the Lagrangian what it does, it, it gives mass the current multiplets that are charged under this, uh, this uh, symmetry. Okay? So these are masses, but they are interesting because they are related to global symmetries. Uh, somehow they take values in the Cartan of the, of the global symmetry, of the flavor symmetry. Uh, you cannot do it for the R, uh, for the R symmetry. OK, any, any question on this? OK, so this is the data that we can play with. So you see that even with these uh, two type of multiplets, we have a, already a, quite a rich structure. And then we can go on and write actions. 
And let me just uh, write down uh, the kinetic actions. Uh, just to give you some example, once again, this action, how do you obtain this action? Either we take this background that we worked out and we substitute in the supergravity action, or if you don't want to play with supergravity because we are lazy, we can do this uh, by hand uh, method, which is still correct. And the final result is the following. So, uh, so the, for the, 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 the kinetic action for the vector multiplet looks like the following. <laughs> So all the fits are in the adjoint representation. So of course there is uh, the, the, the kinetic term for the gauge field. Oh, and let me, well, here, here I, I need to tell you what are the fields here. So in the vector multiple, there is a vector. There is uh, a gaugeino. In fact, there are, uh, well, it's, it's a complex gaugeino. And then there is a complex scalar that I will write as sigma 1 plus i sigma 2. And then uh, there is uh, the d term that you also have in four dimensions. Well, this scalar comes from reducing the vector along the two direction that you reduce from four to two. So these are the fields that should appear in this action. And uh, here, so for instance, this is, well, okay, let me write it and then I will comment. And maybe I will not write the fermions. OK, so this is the bosonic part of the action. So you see, if you send r to infinity, this is just a flat space, uh, the standard Lagrangian. So there is the, the Young-Mills uh, kinetic term. There are the standard kinetic terms for these scalars. Uh, well, there is this uh, commutator that, if you wish, comes from the fact that the group is non-abelian in four dimensions. So there is a. a commutator in the Young-Mills and then becomes a commutator of the scalars. Uh, and there is the square of the D term. Uh, but now, because we are on the sphere, there are these relevant deformations of the action. And they appear as this deformation term here and this deformation term here. OK? And uh, what concerns the matter uh, Lagrangian? So this is the, the kinetic term for the chiral multiplet. And it looks like the following. So once again, let me write it, and then I, I will comment. And then we have the fermions. And so well, the same com comment uh, applies. If we send this r to infinity, we are back to the flat space Lagrangian that just follows from uh, taking uh, the kinetic term for a chiral multiple in four dimensions and reducing. Uh, and here, so we can look at this. Uh, now, these are the relevant deformations that we obtain on the sphere. And now you see this uh, little, uh, this uh, small r is the r charge of the chiral multiplet. So the fields in the chiral multiplets are this complex scalar phi. And the, this is the complex auxiliary field f that you have in four dimensions. Uh, so this is the r charge. And as I promised, the r charge does enter into the Lagrangian. This is not so in flat space, but this is so in, uh, in, this curved, uh, in this curved action. Uh, and in fact, it controls, you see, some curvature couplings, as, as, as I was saying. Um, so these are some masses, or some cubic term here. And these are masses for the scalar. They uh, do enter into the Lagrangian, because the R-symmetry now is part of the supersymmetry algebra. OK. Yes. Without the R, yes. No, not with the R. So without the R, it's just that. that, that yeah. We could see that, that coming from four. Yes. But, but not with the R. Not with the R. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, can this be then the, the reduction of the pestum branch I've already deformed in four dimensions? But not at pestum. You could try to do S2 times T2. But uh, this would work for the twist, but doesn't work for the untwist. So un unless I'm, if I remember correctly, I'm not 100% sure. But I think that uh, you, you could try to put the untwist here. And here it's just flat. I don't think that is a supersymmetric solution in four dimensions. Uh, but uh, okay, I'm 95% sure. <laughs> So now, uh, uh, so these are the kinetic actions. Then there are the interaction. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to write it. Um, uh, it's a similar story. Uh, there are various deformations. Um, so, so, so now we should choose a contour. And we can choose, in fact, we can do something very similar. We can choose a real contour. By this, what I mean is that simply a fields that were real in Lorentzian, now it gets complexified in Euclidean, and the contour that you choose is just that they are real. And complex field in Euclidean, in Lorentzian, they become two independent fields in, uh, in, Eu in Euclidean. We just choose the contour where one is the complex conjugate of the other. So it's the most basic thing that we could try. Um, so this is a, a contour that makes uh, the patinterial convergent because it makes these, uh, these two actions positive definite. Um, and so uh, and now, OK, we choose some. So we have many supercharges. We choose a supercharge uh, to do the localization. We don't have to use all of them. Uh, so it's convenient to use some supercharge. Let me call delta q, uh, which is done in the following way. You choose one epsilon. And you use one epsilon tilde. So out of these four, you choose one. And, and you just localize with respect to that. And if you do that, you discover the following, that in fact, the super young mills action is q exact. This is delta q of something uh, that you can work out. And uh, uh, the matter uh, kinetic action is also q exact. So this is quite interesting for two reasons. So first of all, this is telling us that, uh, so here I forgot the gauge coupling. Uh, so this is telling us that, in fact, if you compute a partition function, this theory is not going to depend on the gauge coupling. Okay? And this is uh, important, uh, useful, because in two dimensions, the gauge coupling is dimensionful. So it sets a scale. If you want above this scale, the theory is weakly coupled. And below, the theory is, is strongly coupled. But since there is no dependence on the gauge coupling, it means that there is no dependence on the RG scale. And so um, well, what we are going to compute is independent of the, yeah, it's, uh, independent of the RG flow. Yes. Uh, phi tilde equal to f. Sorry. Uh, f tilde is equal to yes. And phi tilde is equal to. Uh, yeah, the complex conjugate. So what about the second? There are some i's there. Uh, let's see. So it's some phase. Uh, no, I mean, it doesn't have to be uh, reflection positive. Uh, so we know that uh, the R deformation breaks uh, reflection positivity. So, so it will be, so the claim is that this is just the, if you want, the, 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 the trivial, um, so you go from Lorentzian to Euclidean, and this is a contour that essentially is the rotation of that. Uh, but, but it does break, I mean, the background does break. Uh, Reflection positivity. So sigma, sigma one is real. Sigma one is real. Phi tilde is phi. Sigma one and sigma two are real in this contour, yes. Okay. Um, so, so as you said, there is no dependence on the gauge coupling. There is also not dependence on the wave function normalization of uh, of uh, phi of uh, yeah of five. 
this follows from here. And then the second observation is that, in fact, uh, uh, we can directly use these two guys to do the localization. We don't have uh, to find a V that does this. Uh, well, essentially, we can use this. So whatever this is that I'm not going to write, we can choose this as our V, okay? because these are Q exact. And uh, well, we also know that they're also Q closed because these are super symmetric. But we can also check it. Okay. I'm sorry? Yes, so the interaction Lagrangian, what about the interaction Lagrangian? Uh, well, we mentioned various types of interaction Lagrangians. So it turns out that superpotential is uh, Q exact. And uh, um, so in particular, there is no dependence on the coefficients in the superpotential. Yet, the superpotential is not completely trivial because the superpotential fixes the R charges. And the Lagrangian does depend on the R charges. So still, there is a small remnant of the superpotential. It's, it's not completely, uh, the partition vacuum is not completely independent of the superpotential. But it does not depend on the coefficients that you put there. Uh, twisted superpotential. Uh, this is not Q exact. And so, in fact, this twisted superpotential does give us parameters, and the partition function will depend on these parameters. In particular, a simple, a simple, cho I mean, a, a simple superpotential, if you want the simplest superpotential, is a linear one, just because a constant drops out, doesn't do anything. The linear one uh, is a Fayette-Heliopoulos term. And, uh, and so the partition function will depend on Fayetteopoulos terms. And uh, so what else did we mention? And the other one was twisted masses. And uh, there is a dependence on twisted masses. Um, so from this is not also not Q exact. Uh, and, and this is because, well, in the deformed algebra that I wrote, I didn't put the central charges. Uh, but essentially, the twisted masses are, are central charges. So they deform the algebra. And because of that, uh, they, they do affect the, the, the result. Just to yes. Sigma 1 plus sigma 2. Uh, this is positive, definite. Yeah, because uh, commutator is, uh, I mean, sigma 1, sigma 2, uh, dagger. This is sigma 2, dagger, sigma 1, right? which is, uh, if I take them real, so I get a minus sign from the dagger. So it's uh, imaginary, if you want. Sigma 1, sigma 2, commutator is imaginary. Yes. OK. Um, now, um, OK. Uh, so, um, so we can try to use uh, these two, um, these two um, actions as localizing term. Now here, because of lack of time, I'm, I'm uh, okay, not going to do the full details. So using the super young mills is perfectly OK, because along the contour, it, this is positive definite. Now this one is not, strictly speaking, is not positive definite. So for instance, uh, so it's positive definite once you fix this, this object here. It's positive definite in the fields of the Carroll multiplet. But of course, here there is a cubic term. A cubic term cannot be positive definite. So in fact, uh, uh, if you want something that is really positive definite, you do have for, this, for the Carroll multiplet to construct the QV. So if you want the V, which is given by the sum over fermions of uh, Q psi, um, double dagger psi. Uh, and, and you can construct this object, which is truly positive definite. I'm not going to write it, because uh, it will take me some time. I don't, also don't have my notes. Um, but OK. OK, so um, 
So, uh, so what do we do? So first step now is to, uh, or, or uh, whatever step we are, is to uh, figure out what are the BPS configurations, because the path integral localizes to the BPS configurations. And, uh, and so let's see. So this will be zeros of the localizing action. And uh, it turns out that this is very simple now, because you see, this is a sum of squares. And so the BPS locus is just given by, uh, well, we have to set to zero all the, all the terms. And so, um, so the first term gives us this equation. Uh, the other term, get this equation. And then we have So we have this. And you see, this is very simple, because this is telling us that sigma 1 and sigma 2, so first of all, they commute, so we can diagonalize them. And uh, uh, so this means that also f and d should be diagonal. Uh, since sigma is in the adjoint, now if everything is diagonal, this is our standard derivatives. And so sigma 1 and sigma 2 are just constant. And then also d and f are, are constant. And so we find a very simple, from the gauge sector, we find a very simple solution in which, um, um, so all the, the, these, these guys, so all the fields are constant and diagonal. Uh, now sigma 1 now becomes, uh, so can take any real value for each of the Cartan directions in the gauge group. Uh, but of course, from here we get a constraint because the sigma is a real uh, field, uh, but this is the field strength. And there is a Dirac quantization condition for the field strength. So this is quantized. And as a result, so the sigma 2 should be quantized. And, uh, uh, and so in particular, way, if we want, we can parameterize d, which is equal to sigma 1 over r. We can call it a over r squared. Now a is dimensionless. Um, because these fields were dimensionful. And uh, f12, which is sigma 2 over r, we can call it uh, some m over 2 r squared. And this m is a magnetic flux, uh, because essentially it's the integral of f12. F, uh, so this is the m is precisely the results of integrating the field strength uh, so I hope, so this, this f is the field strength. So I hope uh, there's no confusion with this. this maybe you want to call it some calligraphic f. This is the auxiliary field. It's, it's not the same f. Uh, but so this is the magnetic flux, and this has to be quantized. This should satisfy um, uh, well GNO quantization condition. Uh, in other words, uh, if you want, this is an element of the algebra. Now, if you exponentiate it, this is an element of the group. And the condition is that this, in fact, is the identity in the group. Okay? So this is the GNO quantization condition. Uh, for you, one is obvious. It just tells us that this flux is integer. But if you have a generic uh, group, this, this is the condition. OK. And then, uh, uh, and then OK, now the, since in the gauge sector, this is the solution. If you want, we can plug this into here. And we can see what is the condition on the, on the matter fields. If you want to be more precise, you should use the, the version, which is positive definite uh, on, on, on the nose. Uh, but then what we get from here is something very simple. It's just that phi and, and phi tilde are 0. And the auxiliary field uh, uh, is, uh, is 0. OK, so we get something very, very simple. And this is nice because, uh, uh, as we said uh, in uh, yesterday lecture, um, or maybe we, we didn't say it, but um, it is true that localization reduces our path integral to a simpler problem, because we only integrate on a subset of fields. 
But uh, first of all, if you want to get some mileage, this uh, reduced space should be finite dimensional. If it is still infinite dimensional, it's a simpler field theory, but it's still a field theory. Uh, so first of all, you want that this subspace is finite dimensional, which is not always the case. Uh, moreover, it might still be a complicated space, maybe some uh, modular space of some complicated partial differential equations that we don't have handle on. Uh, but in this case, it's very simple. You see, we can parameterize in a very simple way. Uh, and, and so um, this is going to lead us to a very concrete uh, formula for the, for the partition function. And, and of course, we're not guaranteed that this is the case. There are other examples in which the problem remains uh, complicated. So OK, this is our BPS locus. Uh, then the next step is to compute the on-shell action. So we should take this configuration, plug them into the action. Now we're not going to get anything from uh, uh, the, the kinetic terms, because we say those are Q exact. And so we just get 0. Um, so the only place where we get something non-zero uh, that I raised is the twi uh, twisted superpotential. It's the only term which is not Q exact. Okay? Sorry, yes. Can you where did you get the conditions for the matter Yes. So one way is that, so OK, I just <laughs> uh, I had this expression. If you want, since we found the solution for, uh, for uh, the gauge, so take the solution, plug it back. If you keep fixed this, that was positive definite in the matter fields, if you keep fixed this. And then you see that, uh, I mean, it was quadratic, and so the only solution is that they are 0. But if you want to be more precise, you can construct one which is really positive definite with respect to all fields, and you get the same result. OK, so this was the BPS uh, configurations that contribute to the path integral. Then the next step is the classical action. So it's very simple. You take this superpotential, the action that you get from the twisted superpotential. You plug in this. And I'm just going to write the result, because I didn't write anything before. So this comes from twisted uh, superpotential. And in particular, if we specialize to uh, only a linear twisted superpotential, uh, which is just a, a, a fayette Lyopoulos term, uh, then what we get is something uh, is something like the following. So this psi is the fayette Lyopoulos term. For since this is a linear term, there's a coefficient in front of it. Uh, and then the rest depends on the, <coughs> so there is sigma 1, and there is, uh, uh, well, the twisted superpotential, the, the Fayetteopoulos term in two dimensions is complexified. So, so really, this, this Fayetteopoulos term uh, contains a, a real part and, uh, well, an imaginary part, which is a theta angle in two dimensions. You can turn on a theta angle. And so this is, uh, so this, OK, depends on the parameters uh, in, the, in the action and depends on where you are on the BPS locus. Okay? So if, you, if I draw again this picture where we have this, our space of field configurations and there is a special locus, which is the BPS locus, uh, this is the classical action that you get, we get at a certain point on this BPS locus. And we will have to integrate over this, and this is a function of our this space. Any question? OK, so uh, we're almost to the end. So now we need to compute one loop determinant. And so these one loop determinants are computed from the localizing term because the term dominates in our uh, deformation. So they're not computing with the, with the original action. They are computed with the QV. However, we chose the, the kinetic term as our QV. So in this particular case, we just use the, the kinetic terms that I wrote. Um, 
Now, as I said, um, we can, one can either try to compute exactly the spectrum. In general, this is uh, very well, impo actually impossible. Or I can use more sophisticated uh, uh, tricks or uh, methods, mathematical methods that have to do with uh, index theorems. And they use the fact that in these super determinants, there are a lot of cancellations, and they are only after the terms that do not cancel. And they usually solve uh, simpler equations. So I will not describe this term, these, these methods. Uh, maybe Samir will say something. Um, but in this particular case, it means we have the round as two. Uh, one can actually compute exactly the spectrum because there is a lot of symmetry. So, uh, so for instance, if you look at the chiral multiplet, just to give you an idea, so this one loop determinant, uh, as you said, this is nothing else that uh, uh, the determinant of the fermionic operator over the determinant of the bosonic operator. And these two operators are the, the quadratic expansion of the, in this case, the kinetic term for spinors and the quadratic expansion of the kinetic term for, uh, scal for uh, scalars uh, at uh, a given point. Okay? This also will be a function of where we are on this manifold. So we expand around that point at quadratic order. We get this two operator and we should compute all the, by the spectrum of this. And as I said, in this case, we have a particularly simple situation. So we can actually use spherical harmonics. And we just take all the harmonics. We expand these fields in harmonics, and we compute uh, the spectrum. So one uses uh, the so-called monopole spherical harmonics. These are some objects that. Uh, depend uh, on some angular momentum on the sphere. So j will be the angular momentum. j3 is the z component. But it also depends on a spin. And in fact, these objects also take into account abelian charges of these fields. Because as we said, in two dimensions, there is no distinction between spin and other electri abelian electric charges. So all these fields, each component of this field is some uh, uh, line bundle on the sphere. And the spherical harmonics uh, are, are simply, um, well, the spherical harmonics, but not for a function, but rather for uh, sections of, of line bundle on the sphere. Okay? So they take into account both the actual spin and uh, electric charge under uh, the magnetic field. And uh, yes, in particular, these are the eigenfunctions of the operator d mu. Uh, squared, uh, where in this d mu, as you say, there is both the spin connection and the, the connection under the, well, the, the, the gauge connection. Okay? So these are just the eigenfunctions. And so uh, just to give you a flavor, because we don't have time to go into the details of this computation, uh, well, maybe this is useful to keep. So just to give you a flavor, for instance, we take the scalar operator, we expand the quadratic order, and we get uh, some uh, well, essential Laplacian, uh, the contribution of this d term, uh, these objects here. And so this is our operator, and we just have to take all these harmonics and we act on them. So we know what is the eigenvalue under this, because this is the eigenfunctions. And all the other ones are just, uh, well, they just multiply by this value, because there are no derivatives. And so one gets to some expression uh, for this determinant, which would be some uh, product of uh, eigenvalues. Um, but, I mean, the expression is not important, because we are not going into the details. And here there will be some expressions. So this determinant will just be some product of all the eigenvalues that we get from all the, all the eigenfunctions. So, um, so we do the same thing for the fermionic operator. 
And we get a similar expansion. Once again, we use the very same harmonics. They work for any spin, integer or half integer. By the way, you can find these monopole harmonics on a paper, if I correctly, of Wu and Yang. Uh, but you can also find them on Wikipedia, and then from there you can find references to papers. Um, OK, so once you have these two, these two determinants, uh, then the loop determinant is the ratio. And uh, as I promised, there are lots of cancellations because of supersymmetry. So many of the eigenvalues that you find here, you also find here. And so in this ratio, it's, uh, it's much simpler. So let me actually write this expression. So this is the expression that one obtains. It's still an infinite product on this n. And then here there are the r charges that do appear uh, in, the, in, the, in the quadratic operators. And there is this parameter a, which parameters these continuous directions that we have to integrate over. And there is this parameter m, which is the magnetic flux, which instead is quantized, and so it's more like a sum. So if you want, this modular space looks like, uh, like this for each value of m. Uh, there is some uh, continuous space, which is parameterized by A. So you get an expression like this. Now, this still does not make sense, strictly speaking, because this product is not convergent. And so one needs to regularize this. And uh, for instance, one way to regularize it is to use uh, zeta function regularization. And uh, so how, how this is done? Well, one takes, uh, in this particular case, the Horwitz zeta function. Uh, well, for generic values of the R charges, there are no zeros. For generic values of the parameters, there are no zeros. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's not prime. I mean, nothing has to be excluded. And then by analytic continuation, this might have poles, of course. But, um, but in general, there are no zero modes to remove. So this is the Hurwitz zeta function. This series converges if the real part of z is large enough. Then you can continue by analytic continuation uh, on the whole complex plane. And then uh, uh, essentially you use that if you compute a derivative with respect to z of this object, what you get is, and you evaluate it z equal to 0, uh, this you cannot really do. I mean, you can compute this, but you cannot use this expression because this expression is not valid at z equal to 0. But if you try to formally do it, so let me put this expression in quotation marks just because this is wrong, but it's formally what you get. Which uh, up to a log is precisely what we want to compute is a product of n plus something. Uh, but in fact, the correct expression for this, and I'm, now I'm not using quotation marks, is a gamma function. And so, and so this expression, which I should write in quotation marks, this is not, this is not really uh, mathematically well defined, is regularized by the gamma function. And the end of the day, the one loop determinant uh, for, uh, for matter fields is given by uh, an expression. So of course, here we'll be a bit, a bit quick. So of course, the, the matter fields are in the gauge representation. So for each weight of the gauge representation, uh, we get one of these uh, one, one component in this equation. And so really, we get a product over all the weights in the gauge representation of some expression that involves the gamma functions.
Now, uh, but the specific expression is not important. I mean, this is just one example. But what is important to note is that, uh, OK, first of all, it's a very explicit function. So we do get um, some function. It's also relatively simple. It's just a ratio of gamma functions. Uh, this function does depend on the R charges. And it, it does depend on the points where we are in this BPS manifold. So it depends on A and M. And then at the end of the day, we will have to integrate over A and sum over M. And uh, well, it's a product of all the weights in the, in the gauge representation. Any, any question? OK, then something similar has to, do, to be done with the gauge sector. So uh, well, I will not go into the details, but uh, if I just take, can I take my uh, fa fa five minutes since my last lecture? <laughs> so, um, so now we have to do the similar thing for the vector multiplet. So the only new detail that I want to add in the, in the, in the gauge sector is that one has to do gauge fixing, of course. And so, um, and so one has to add a gauge fixing action. And, uh, um, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, essentially, so what you use is the well, gauge fixing in, a, in a, a background field, because also with the gauge field, well, we have to separate between uh, uh, if you want a, 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 a classical part, which is uh, the classical configuration that gives you the, the BPS, plus oscillations. Now, these oscillations are, again, weighted by uh, 1 over t to the 1 half, because we want to keep uh, canonical normalization. And so this gauge fixing action uh, that involves, uh, so involves the ghosts. These ghosts, I remind you, these are scalar, but they are, are anti-commuting, and they are in the adjoint. So this is the standard Fadev, uh, Fadev uh, um, gauge fixing terms. I'm, go I'm not going to explain this. But, uh, um, but uh, uh, the important point is that in these covariant derivatives, only the background part enters. Okay? And uh, the oscillatory part is as written explicitly. Okay? So in all these covariant derivatives, only the classical part enters. And so in this sense, this action is actually quadratic in the, in the oscillations. Okay? So uh, as I said, this is the standard uh, gauge fixing action that you can find on pa um, Peskin, for instance. And so, and so then you do the same thing. So you, you take the young mills action around each point. You expand the quadratic order. You also have to do it for the gauge fixing action. And so in the set of fields, you will also have the ghosts. And so, uh, and so what you compute is uh, something very similar. Uh, yeah, I didn't say this psi is not the Fayette-Tiliopoulos term. It's the parameter that you use in arc-c gauge. So at the end of the day, there should not be any dependence on the psi. You can either fix it to, I don't know, whatever you want, or keep it and check that uh, you're doing correctly. Uh, and, so, uh, and so here now you will have uh, You will have three pieces here. There will be the term, uh, a piece from the gauge field. Uh, since it's real, you have a square root. Uh, you have a piece from the gauge geno, and you have a piece from the, from the ghosts. Uh, but otherwise, you do the same thing. You use spherical harmonics, and you do exactly the same computation. And uh, it turns out that you get something very simple.
So once again, the details of the expression are not important, but uh, what is important is there's a very simple expression. So first of all, here we have uh, now a product over the roots of the gauge group, uh, which are if on the weights of the joint representation. Um, uh, so uh, once again, we have the magnetic flux M and this parameter A, this continuous parameter. You see this time this function is very simple. It's just a quadratic function up to a sign. Uh, but then, because of the, of the zero modes, it turns out that there are some zero modes, there is also this, this product over these factors in which you have to take a product over the roots that annihilate the particular magnetic flux that you are considering. So at the end of the day, there will be a sum over this. Um, and I'm not going to explain where you get this, but just comes from uh, doing this analysis with spherical harmonics. OK, so once we have our one loop determinants, uh, what do we have to do? Well, it turns out that there are, in fact, some bosonic zero modes here. And uh, uh, essentially, these bosonic zero modes, they span the Cartan subalgebra, which is not broken by this magnetic flux. So if th there is no magnetic flux, this will be the whole Cartan subalgebra, but the magnetic flux uh, lifts these zero modes. And so there is also some uh, uh, integral over the zero modes. Uh, once again, seems I'm not going into the details here. We don't really need uh, expressions. Um, OK, okay there's really no point in writing this. But OK, we have, so this will be our one loop determinant. Uh, from the gauge sector. And then the final thing that we have to do is to put everything together. And we get an expression like the following. So this is the dimension of the Weyl group. And if you want, this is a discrete uh, residual um, gauge, uh, a discrete gauge group that remains. Uh, that is the one that permutes the, the um, Cartan components after we have di diagonalized. But the, part the important point is that we have our sum or integral over the BPS configurations. So in particular, there will be a sum over magnetic fluxes. And there will be an integral. So this is this parameter m. There will be an integral. Uh, let me call k uh, the, the rank of the gauge group. Of, uh, there will be an integral of these parameters A. And then we will have the classical action that I wrote before. And then we will have the one loop determinants that there is really no point in uh, writing them again. Um, so one from the gauge sector and one from the chiral, uh, from the chiral multiplets. And these functions that we wrote, these are functions of A uh, and M, uh, as well as uh, of, of some parameters like the R charge uh, or, uh, or twisted masses that have not discussed here, uh, which, which are not in integrated over. So this is just a concrete realization of the abstract formula that I wrote uh, uh, yesterday. OK, so let me just uh, conclude by making uh, uh, some comments on this. So one comment is that uh, it is easy to generalize this uh, in the case where we include uh, op operators. And so in particular, Diego was talking about this uh, formula for computing the expectation value of Wilson loops. Also here, we could include Wilson loops. Uh, the, the, the difference would just be that here we get some extra factor, which is just the evaluation of the Wilson loop on the, 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 the background. So it, it would be on the same footing as the classical action. Very simple. Another comment is that, uh, well, this formula is incredibly simple. Uh, just an integral and some sum, very simple functions. These are ratio of gamma functions and so on. 
Uh, but in fact, this formula is exact. I stress once again, this is the exact result of the PAT integral. And so in particular, it should contain all non-perturbative corrections. So is it true that it contains all non-perturbative corrections? And in fact, one can see explicitly that it, it is. Uh, because with some trick, so this integral, if you want, is an integral along the real line. Uh, so suppose we are in rank 1, is an integral along the real line. Now, one way to evaluate this integral is to close the integral at infinity. Of course, you have to check that there are no, that, that uh, I mean, the, the, this integral uh, goes to 0 at infinity. You can check it. Uh, and then use the Cauchy trick. You reduce this to a sum over poles. And it turns out that these gamma functions, they have many poles. In fact, there is a wedge, if you want a two-parameter uh, uh, two parameter lattice of, of poles. So you, you, you can write this as a sum over the residue of all these poles. And it turns out that each pole is an instant on contribution. You can uh, exactly identify it as the contribution from a vortex. In two dimensions, instantons are, are vortices. Um, and in fact, you could do the localization computation in a different way and reduce it to a sum over all these uh, per, uh, non-perturbative uh, contributions. And you can explicitly see with this simple Cauchy trick that uh, uh, all of them are contained in this formula. So this is uh, reassuring. OK, uh, so I think I will stop here. <laughs>